movement for independence at the age of 16. I joined the Scottish National Party and I was in the Scottish National Party for 27 years. I grew up in a world where, as we mentioned before, but I'll say it again, there were certain certainties. The Berlin Wall would never come down. There would never be peace in Europe. There would never be a Scottish Parliament. And Hibs wouldn't win the Scottish Cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's still true. We have a Parliament, but we don't have a Parliament for our children. We have a Parliament limited entirely by self-seeking individuals in Westminster who originate in this country. From 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night on the 18th of September, for the first time in our lives, we, the people, have the power to retain power to retain the sovereignty of this country in this country. We have to, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, irrespective of your age, we have to retain that power. This is not like any other election. This doesn't involve politicians in real terms. There are proposals for a potential future Scotland from the Scottish National Party, from the Scottish Greens, even for Labour for Independence. But if we retain that sovereignty, then in 2016, at the first independence election, we, the people, will be able to choose the parties who are focused entirely and only on the benefit of this country. So I, I grew up believing that the purpose of government was primarily to foster the well-being of its people, to work for its people, to develop an economy to protect and serve those people from cradle to grave. 57 years I've been alive on this planet, I can't think of a single year where the UK government in Westminster has met any of those criteria. It simply has not happened. For many, many, many different reasons, which I probably don't really have the time to go into at the moment. But what I'm really saying is this, it is now time for us to take the responsibility on behalf of the future generations to give them the ability to deliver the futures that they want, rather than allowing someone else, somewhere else, to deliver a future that they believe in. And that's our responsibility. It's also our responsibility to convince absolutely everybody we know who is either believing that they should vote no or who is unconvinced that they have to take that responsibility not for what happens on the 19th of September of this year but what happens on the 19th of September 3014 and where our country lies then. What I believe in is democracy. I'm a socialist but I believe in democracy. I believe that only with the normalisation of our democracy, what that means is a sovereign parliament sitting in Edinburgh, elected by the people of this country, the people who live in this country, which produces political parties with ideologies and policies focused entirely on the well-being of the people of this country. That's normalisation. That's democracy. At the moment, we, look, we live in a, a perverted concept of democracy. If every single Scottish elected MP voted for a policy which was the desire of all of us, it can still be voted down in Westminster. That is not democracy by anyone's definition. I would also say this. If the union is working, now this has been referred to before, but we cannot, we, we, we must emphasise on these things. If the union is working, why do I see people begging in the streets of Edinburgh that I have never seen in my life before until around about 1980? I've never seen that. Why do we have food banks in the 14th richest country in the world? Why? 
Is that a government that's focused on the well-being of the people? Why is it that we have payday loan companies? Our people are so badly paid that in the last week before they receive their salary, or even on the Thursday before they receive their wages on a Friday, it's necessary for them to get a loan to see them through those days. That's not the country I grew up in. And it certainly isn't the country that's the 14th richest country in the world. Let me point something out to you, though, it's quite interesting. The OECD figures for Scotland and the UK in 1998, the year that Tony Blair was elected Prime Minister, and the year that Gordon Brown became the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the OECD figures put, Scott, put the UK at the 10th richest country in the world, and Scotland at the 7th. We're now the 14th, as a product of those two gentlemen I just mentioned. I was a member of the Scottish Parliament from 1999 until 2003. And I'll give you a few examples of why devolution doesn't work. Devolution max, devolution mini, whatever. I should tell you why. When the Parliament was formed, one of the first inquiries that were done was about the school estate around the country. The recognition that we had school buildings falling down all over the place and we also required hospitals. Now all of those things prior to 1999 had been paid for out of the public sector borrowing requirement, which was effectively the cheapest way to get money. The first time we had to vote on this in the Parliament, the Labour Party, the Liberal Party and the Tory Party told us there was only one game in town. That was the private finance initiative. Now, why was that the only game in town, apart from the fact that our parliament didn't have the ability to, to raise its own loans? It was because of the deal that Blair and Brown had made with the City of London to release money, government money, and to provide a profit stream for investment bankers in London. So you have, in East Lothian, uh, a library, I think, at the school, medical centres, and, and school refurbishments, all of which, at the end of 30 years of you paying for them, you will not own. The main hospital for this area, the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, we will pay £25.2 billion pounds over a 30-year period for that building, at the end of which we won't own it. Already, the contract to run the ERI and get the benefit that's going to it from NHS Lothian every year has changed hands for a huge profit three times since the building was built. So not only are we paying for the building, we've created a circumstance and a, and a principle whereby you can sell, buy and sell public service buildings at a profit because you know you're going to get the income from the public sector, at the end of which we won't own it. Would you buy a house on the basis of you pay a mortgage for 25 years and at the end of 25 years the building society owns it? Why have we done that or allowed that to happen with our public service buildings? Where next? Where next to go? The next failure, genuine failure of devolution, came in, in simple things. In 2002, I proposed a bill for free prescriptions, partly because free prescriptions were proceeding through the Welsh Assembly, a bill to bring in reintroduced free prescriptions. The Royal College of Nursing. British Medical Association all said that this was a good idea, that it would actually be a cost saver in the long run. The Labour Party would not sign the bill, the Tories wouldn't sign the bill, and the Liberals, who of course were in the coalition government with the Labour Party in the Scottish Parliament, wouldn't sign the bill, so it didn't come to pass until we had an SNP and Green majority in the, in the Parliament that allowed it to happen. Why didn't they want prescriptions in Scotland? It was partly because the Scottish Labour Party, as opposed to the Welsh Labour Party, was completely in thrall to Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. Rodri Morgan, who was the First Minister, or, well, I can't remember if that's what they called him at the time, the First Minister in Wales was not in thrall to them and said, we are doing this because it's the right thing for our people. But the Scottish Labour MSPs would not do it because they had to check with head office in London. And head office in London said, no, so our people were deprived of that. The following year, 2003, there was a bill going through the Parliament which would have given compensation to all those people who had acquired hepatitis C or HIV from contaminated blood products in the NHS in Scotland. The 
Labour Party, to their eternal shame, refused to vote for that legislation. And the reason, again, why they refused to vote for that legislation was because there would have been an imperative of Gordon Brown, who was the Chancellor at the time, to provide the same for the people in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. And he wasn't prepared to bear the cost. So our people, who had contracted hepatitis C and HIV, went without that compensation until 2007. Then to get to the, the bigger, bigger issues. The failure of devolution in all its forms as follows, particularly in the area of defence and foreign policy. The vast majority of people in this country were against the war in Iraq. They didn't want to see either our servicemen and women killed, neither did they want to be culpable for the three quarters of a million Iraqis who have died since we started that war. The Parliament debated it. We weren't allowed to take a proper vote on it. We couldn't veto whether we went to war. So it's another proof of the necessity for independence. Devolution is a chimera. It's a mirage, a pretense of power, when in reality, devolution is power retained. If we allow ourselves to continue to have our foreign and defence policy dictated to us by Westminster, then we will spend three to five hundred billion pounds on replacing a nuclear deterrent, well it deters apart from the building of hospitals and schools, I don't know, a nuclear deterrent, the bulk of the jobs in building it, the bulk of that three to five hundred billion pounds will actually go to US companies and provide jobs in Florida for the missiles and computer systems. The, uh, the steel cigar will be built at Barrow in, in Furness and that's about all the jobs that the UK will get from it. We need to be able to make these choices. I mean, does anyone here genuinely believe that it's a better idea in a country that is one trillion pounds in debt for us to spend 300 to 500 billion pounds on a, a weapon system which all British Prime Ministers have said they would never use, that threatens not only our lives, if this ongoing developing desire for a new Cold War with the Russian Federation continues and we have that face off again, then Scotland becomes what it was when the Americans had the base of the noon. It becomes strike area number one. It becomes the aircraft carrier for NATO nuclear weapons. Or would we rather spend that money on taking our pensioners, 35% of whom are in poverty, taking them out of poverty, providing them with a decent pension, providing for the 250,000, quarter of a million out of five million people, children in poverty, out of poverty. Do we want to spend upwards of 250 billion pounds on a high-speed rail train that goes from London to Crewe and is being sold to us as somehow going to help Scottish business? You know, Michelle would have to say about that. Does it cost us actually? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as I remember, when we were building Eurotunnel, I would be able to get on a train in Edinburgh. Go to sleep and wake up in Paris. Anybody done that yet? Without having to get off a train? No. The Heathrow runway upgrade. Another hundred billion pounds. For another runway in London, where our whiskey, whiskey can be shipped out by Diageo. And it was interesting that that figure was brought up. Five billion pounds worth of whiskey out of Scotland. 52 billion pounds worth of whiskey out of London. And all that taxation going where? Not to us. Some positives about the Parliament, which might not be positive for very much longer, but, but just to finish off that section. What do we want to spend our money on? Do we want to spend our money on our people or do we want to spend our money on vanity projects for British politicians? Because the reality is, the upgrade and replacement of the Trident weapons of mass destruction 
is so that we can say, so that the UK ministers can say that they're in the big boys club for the French, the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans, and now Pakistan and India. It means that they retain this false concept of themselves as this country of the United Kingdom being an important and powerful country in the world by keeping their place in the Security Council of the United Nations. That's the real threat. They won't get to go to all these nice parties. They won't be able to strut their stuff when they go back to Eton or Harrow to tell what it was like being Prime Minister or Chancellor. These are not the priorities of a government that wishes to, for its people to prosper and for their welfare to be looked after. The positives from our Parliament have been free care for the elderly, free tuition fees for our students, free eye tests, free dental checks, free bus travel, which is very important here for two reasons. My mother lives in Aberlady, she's on a, a standard single person's pension. If she wants to go and see her grandchildren in Edinburgh, it would cost her £7.80 a day out of £113 a week. Astonishing. For the traders in this town, I know this to be true because there were figures done about it before the last uh, council elections. Since the introduction of free bus travel for uh, older people, there's been a slight upturn in trade in places like North Berwick because people are taking a day out, which they couldn't afford to do if it was going to cost them £7.40 well, to North Berwick, it's considerably more. Right, so, free bus travel and free prescriptions. It's already been stated by the Labour Party in Scotland that these are the something for nothing promises, the something for nothing things you get with devolution, and that they will go <coughs> when the cuts come next year. At the moment, of the £25 billion cuts that are coming, charging down the highway at us and our people, only one pound out of every ten pound of cuts has hit us. We can't afford to stay in the United Kingdom anymore. We can't afford for our economy to be drained from the vanity projects of Westminster politicians and Whitehall mandarins. This is our day of destiny on the 18th of September. Power from 7 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night is in your hands. It's your responsibility to future generations to exercise that power and retain the sovereignty that we need for this country. Thank you very much.